Hello, my name is Elena, and today I'm going to be walking you through the process of how myself, my dad, and my husband work together to build a teardrop trailer. I'll take you through each of the steps, all the way starting from design and planning to the finished product. And I'll just talk about some of the stuff that I felt like we learned along the way that was helpful. I'll also try to list a lot of the products we used as I go along, and I'll provide any links that I have in the description. Before we even got started, we spent a lot of time thinking about what was the functionality that we wanted within the teardrop trailer, what we wanted it to look like, um, and just really pulling a lot of inspiration. We also thought a lot about what materials we wanted to use, and we decided pretty, pretty early on that we would do a mix of metal and wood. I spent a lot of time on Pinterest and Instagram looking at builds that other people had done and getting ideas for not only how it would look and the overall aesthetic of the teardrop trailer, but also some of the elements we want to incorporate that would make it super functional. All three of us were really drawn to that classic looking teardrop with the curved front and back. Once I had a good sense of the general design that I wanted to use, I started sketching out a bunch of concepts and the three of us agreed on one that we were really happy with. I even put together a little prototype with a LaCroix box just for good measure. I am happy that we went with the drop shape just because it is so classic, but at the same time, just something to keep in the back of your mind that whenever you're creating something with a ton of curves with wood and metal, it's just going to be more challenging to make sure that everything lines up versus if we had done a more rectangular shaped teardrop trailer, it wouldn't have looked as good in my opinion, but it would have been a lot easier and a lot quicker to accomplish. So just something to think about if you are building your own teardrop. We considered buying a utility trailer that was already made or getting a kit of a bolt together one, but we really just couldn't find one that was affordable, really good quality, and also was the exact dimensions we wanted. So we opted to weld together our own using plans that we found on mechanicalelements.com. Once we had a design that we were happy with, it was time to gather all the materials we needed. There are a lot of options out there for how you can go about building a teardrop trailer. Plenty of people do it out of wood solely, but we decided that we were gonna do um, a metal frame with wood on the interior and exterior. The trailer base would of course be metal, but we decided to also build out a metal frame using one inch by one inch steel square tubing to kind of give the sides the shape that we were going for and also put in support beams along the side and the top. And then we would put plywood on the interior and exterior of the cabin with styrofoam insulation sandwiched in between. We bought our steel just from a local steel supplier, which is something I would just recommend if you're buying in bulk, it tends to be cheaper. As far as the wood went, we also bought local. We have a really cool hardwood store called McBeath Hardwood that we got all of the marine grade plywood from. For the exterior wood, we got one quarter inch marine grade plywood with a veneer of quarter sans sapelli on the outside. We just really liked how it looked and we loved like the beautiful striping that it created and thought it would be a really nice wood finish to the outside of the trailer. For the interior wood, we got that from Lowe's and it is one eighth inch uh, cabinet grade plywood. Almost all the wood we used was quarter inch or eighth inch, but we did use a half inch marine grade plywood for the floor. For the trailer base, we purchased plans for a five foot by eight foot torsion axle trailer. Overall, we were really happy with the mechanical elements plans that we bought. They were really clear and complete, and they gave um, a couple of ways that you could modify the plans without compromising the safety, which is of course really important. The plans were for a maximum load of 3,500 pounds, and we estimated from the beginning that our trailer would weigh around 1,500 pounds, so it was definitely overkill, but better safe than sorry. We cut all the trailer base steel according to the plans and welded them together using a MIG welder. Once the welds had all cooled off, we painted the whole thing with a couple coats of Rust-Oleum brand oil-based primer, and then a few layers of Rust-Oleum brand oil-based paint. We then mounted the timber and spindles and the wheels to the trailer base, both of which we purchased from e-trailer. Once the base was done, we started building the steel frames for the sides using a full-size cutout cardboard template that guided how we curved the metal tubing. We made pie cuts along strategic spots in the tubing to allow for easy bending, and then welded those cuts on all sides to keep them in place along the curve. We started conservatively with how many cuts we needed, and then we added more later to get closer to the template. 
We use the same method for the curved corners of the frame for the side doors. To ensure both sides matched, we welded one according to the template, made sure everything was looking right, and then we took the second piece of tubing, made cuts in the exact same places, and then bent it along following that first one, clamping as we went and welding as we went, just to make sure that the metal wasn't overheating too much and warping. When you have a piece of metal that you're really working on and welding a bunch, it can warp and distort. And so by clamping it along the way and really checking to make sure that they were a perfect match, we were able to ensure consistency. When they were both done, we clamped them to the sides of the base and added in vertical bracing tubes along every foot to provide more rigidity and strength to the sides. At the same time, we created frames inside the door of the windows we bought and made sure they fit snug. Next up, we took the side frames off of the base and cut, layered, and attached wood to them. We layered a sheet of quarter inch plywood that we glued and screwed into the metal frame as the bottom layer and then glued the quarter inch Sapelli plywood over the top of that layer using waterproof tight bond three wood glue. We flipped the whole thing over, set it on an old sheet for protection and put every heavy item we could find to make sure that it dried flat. Once both sides were dry, we welded them to the base and welded cross pieces every couple of feet or so between the two sides. We also added in a frame for the large curved window we would eventually put in at the front. We used pie cuts again to get the curved edges of the frame here. Next step was bending the plywood and sapelli over the front, back, and top of the trailer. Because of how steeply our teardrop curved, we layered two pieces of thinner 1 8 plywood. We glued and screwed the first piece into the metal frame and then glued the additional piece on top of that base using ratcheting straps, clamps, and random pieces of wood to hold everything down in place while the glue dried. At this point, the trailer was actually starting to look a lot like our sketches, which was really exciting, but there was still a decent amount of work to be done. We then applied a sapelli veneer over top of all of that plywood using the same method. Once the sapelli veneer had dried, we quickly realized that it was a slightly lighter color than the sapelli that we had gotten for the sides. To remedy this, we put a stain over top of it Next, we welded the frame for the hatchback door that would open to allow us to access the back of the trailer and eventually build a galley kitchen. We repeated the priming, painting, and wood bending steps we had done on the trailer cabin to the door of the trailer and then attached it using a hurricane hinge with some shocks to keep the door propped up when opened. At this point, we also put in the front curved window, which was a sheet of quarter inch polycarbonate plastic. The piece we used has a UV filter coating on it and we were able to cold bend it to the front radius of the trailer, which just means that we didn't use any heat to get it to conform to the shape we wanted it. Also around this point in the build, we started adding the aluminum sheeting to the sides of the trailer and we even found this really cool diamond plate um, pressed metal for the front and the back. It's not true diamond plate, but it still looks really cool and we thought it would help protect from little rocks flying up while we're driving. We also started running metal and like plastic edging over any seams that needed to be covered up um, just to weatherproof and also where the wall met the ceiling, again, just to make sure that no water was gonna get in and the inside of the cabin would be completely protected from the elements. Next up, we ran the electrical wires through gaps in the metal frame at the bottom of the wall or drilled holes in the metal tubes to allow the wires to pass through. For the insulation, we used half inch styrofoam sheets that we easily cut with box knives to get each piece to fit perfectly into the space between the metal tubing. The insulation covered the walls, ceiling, and would eventually cover the floor. While doing the insulation, we made sure we cut out holes where we wanted the lights and the fan and other electrical elements to come out. So we started planning exactly where those things would sit. The electrical system was made up of many different components and honestly I could do a whole another video explaining more about what we did. But for now I'll just give a brief summary. It all starts with a battery. In this case we decided to go with Dakota lithium battery for the high power density, which means a smaller battery and a higher number of charge cycles, which equates to a longer battery life. This battery did come with a wall charger, but that would mean we would either charge at home before travel or rely on finding power at campsites. We wanted options for extended trips, so we installed two 100 watt solar panels on the roof. The solar panels we used were top solar flexible solar panels from Amazon. We had to create an entry point for the solar panel wires to enter the cabin near the top of the hatchback door. 
These wires connect to a Victron solar controller. Victron has a handy app that allows you to monitor a ton of information, like how much power the panels are generating, what the battery charge status is, and so on. All this info could be a bit much to try to understand at first, but once you use it and see the battery being charged live, you really get a hang of it pretty quickly. We also installed a Victron inverter. For our first trip, we just plugged in a power strip, but in the future when the kitchen cabinets are finished, we will install those outlets so that we can charge larger devices with ease. Lastly, the whole system is run through a Victron smart shunt, which can be thought of as a fuel gauge of the system. We then wired everything to a shutoff switch for emergencies and storage, and the electrical was complete. Once the insulation was all in and the electrical was ready to go, we started cutting out the wood panels for the interior. For the sides, because of the curves, we used butcher paper templates to get a sense of what shape we would need to cut the wood, and then double checked it against the sides. After that, we used that butcher paper template to trace onto the wood the exact curves we would need to cut, and then used a jigsaw to cut them. For the top, we just used a table saw since those were relatively straightforward. For the interior wood, we used this wipe-on polyurethane. And I lied, there was a bit more work once the wood panels were in with the electrical. We soldered the wires of the fan and the lights to their respective wires in the wall and sealed off the solder area with plastic tubes and a heat gun. We had waited to put in the floor until we were really done messing around with the interior just because it was easier to move around in the cabin, but at this point we felt pretty confident putting it in. So we took that marine grade half inch plywood and we painted the bottom to make sure it was protected from water and debris splashing up. We put plastic edging around it to make sure it's sealed into the metal frame perfectly, then put down a layer of the styrofoam insulation and an another layer of half inch plywood on top of that. We did a lot of weatherproofing as we went, but at this point we went through the entire exterior to make sure there's no seams, cracks, or gaps that were left exposed to the elements. Overall, it's really important to make sure no moisture or rain or any of that kind of stuff gets into your cabin because it's just gonna create mold and rot and you put all this work into it and it would be a bummer if that happened. For the couple of spots we found that still needed to be covered up, we used plastic strips and silicone caulking as well as more traditional weather stripping. We also covered all the wood in multiple layers of West System 105 epoxy resin with 207 Special Clear Hardener. I recommend buying the gallon of the epoxy and buying the pumps for the resin and the hardener. Additionally, since epoxy resin has no UV protection in it, we put a layer of exterior polyurethane over it. Between all of the doors, we made sure that there was plenty of weather stripping to ensure that no moisture would get inside the cabin. Around this time, we had plans to do a first trip with the trailer in a couple of weeks, so we decided to get the last couple of details fixed before we tested it out on the road. We built a temporary shelf to hold the battery, inverter, and solar panel system that would protect it and separate it from the main cabin, and we put in a queen mattress in the back so that we have something to sleep on. Once that was done, the teardrop was ready to get tested, weighed, and then registered. We drove it around our block and we were immediately impressed with how well it tracked, how well it took bumps, and how it took turns. It weighed in around 1,300 pounds, which was around 200 pounds less than we had originally estimated, so not bad. A few other elements we included was a handle and lock for the side doors, a roll-up shade that we built a wood frame for to keep in place along the curved window, a vent and a fan on top of the ceiling to help get airflow, book lights on each side that included a USB spot to charge our phones, and brighter lights in the galley in the main cabin. I can talk briefly about the DMV registration process that we went through in California, but if you're not in California, the best advice I can give you is do a ton of research beforehand regarding the rules in your state, come with a lot of patience, and have your forms already filled out. For registration in California, we applied and received a VIN number under the specially constructed or modified vehicle registration process. Then we applied under the permanent trailer identification process. Our total registration fee was $45 and it's valid for five years. So we were happy we designed the trailer to fit into these criteria. The trailer was now ready for the road.
We're on our first trip with the trailer this week, which is really awesome. We've slept in it three nights so far and overall we're really, really happy with how it feels, how the insulation's been working. It was 32 degrees last night and we were really comfortable. Um, the biggest thing we discovered was we had to keep the top vent open because there was a lot of condensation forming on the windows and the walls. Um, and obviously long term that can be a big issue with mold and just general like deterioration of the inside of the cabin. But besides that, it was really comfortable. I slept until 8 a.m., which never happens with camping. So huge improvement from tent camping for us. And yeah, really happy overall with how it's going three nights in. For our first trip, my husband and I drove down from the Bay Area to San Diego to visit some friends. We stopped along the way. We spent two nights in a campground, two nights parked in a friend's uh, driveway, and even one night just kind of parked on the side of the road next to a friend's house. We still do plan on building out a kitchen, but we just couldn't resist now that it's registered and ready to go, taking it on a trip. So that will be the next project. The total cost from the start to this point came out to around 15 grand. Um, our original goal was to be under 10 grand, so we definitely surpassed that. That was due to a lot of factors. Lumber was very pricey when we were working on this build. Um, we opted for some higher quality materials, and of course our solar battery system was on the more expensive side. So I would say if you're looking to do it more budget friendly, you definitely can. But personally, I still think it was completely worth it based on how beautiful it looks. And honestly, building it with your family, just, it's a great experience. I learned so much about every step of the process. It was the first time I'd ever really done electrical, so that was a big learning experience. And I think all three of us took a lot away from this project. I hope this video has been helpful and inspires any of you who've been thinking about it to do your own DIY teardrop trailer. And thanks for watching.